In round three of the FIDE World Cup, I've been particularly enjoying the match between Levon Aronian and Maxim Matlakov. Uh, the first game, well, you can see here, um, Aronian outplayed uh, Matlakov beautifully. Wonderful strategic game. This is the position after 36 moves, and Aronian is on in control on both sides of the board, and he finished the game with... Rook e6, this basically just eliminates this rook and allows white to break through here. Rook takes g7, and well, black is a pawn down here, his pieces can't really move. This one is dropping um, dreadful position, so Maklakov tried his only chance, so that's, that's to push this e pawn. And now, this is wonderful, the queen switched from the queen side and bounced over to the king's side in one move, and black had to resign there. Wonderful finish and wonderful game from Levon Aronian, who is in superb form at the moment. So, game two, Matlakov had to win, stay in the match. If he won, it would be one all, and they'd go to the tie breaks. So Aronian played this um, very solid line, the semi-tarash, and the idea is that black wants to trade off a lot of pieces right from the word go. So you could say the main line is knight f3 and takes bishop b4 check, you trade more uh, another pair of minor pieces and then castle. Now of course white has um, an advantage in space but having traded a some pieces then you know black can hope to defend this and you know these these big guys have worked out black's defense very well indeed but matlakov played rook b1 to keep the pieces on the board that means that if black trades then the rook covers the b4 square so there's no check available so bishop b7 from aronian and white develops, queen c7. And this was an idea that the Cuban, Cuban player, uh, Lenier Dominguez, played in St. Louis against Navarra. Um, that game went like this. Navarra played castles and black expanded on the queen side. And then in order to block out Know, white's attack because white white obviously wants to play e5 at some point and then attack on the king side. Domingos played e5 and uh, got a reasonable position in this game. Matlakov played a4 to prevent b5, which looks like a very sens sensible option. And Aronian, well, had obviously prepared for this move and responded very, very quickly and very aggressively by playing bishop d7 and just looking to take this pawn. Um, so castles, rook c8 first hitting the bishop. And I guess um, white could drop back and defend that pawn, but it would allow black to expand with b5 or or maybe just knight c6 and, and start hitting the bishop again actually that looks more appropriate uh, b5 is certainly interesting um, and knight c6 also with the idea of knight a5 possibly but this is a more straightforward way of playing bishop d3 he's just not bothering with the a pawn at all so black takes this pawn but this bishop well, it's, it's a bit loose, to be honest. Um, tactically, that could be a slight problem. But basically, you know, white is wasting no time here. Rook is also active. That is uh, important. And now, uh, Matlakov didn't waste any time at all in trying to play for the initiative, getting going on the king's side. I think it's a good decision. He played pawn to d5. Excellent move. Um, let me just show you what could possibly happen if this pawn is exchanged. So this opens up the bishop. 
also opens up the E file. And that means that black can't play the natural developing move, knight d7, because the bishop is on prees. So bishop b5 looks like a, a normal continuation to exchange off this dangerous bishop and giving back the pawn, but it will open up the a file. But, for example, you could just play rook e1 here and increase the pressure. Black has problems developing. Um, and also the back rank is weak. This d pawn can be used. This is a serious initiative. But I think, I mean, in view of that and indeed the game continuation, I think black should close the position with e5. Now, of course, this is very committal. And it leaves white with a protected pass pawn. Nevertheless, it seems to me sensible to try and shut out this bishop and the rest of white's pieces as well. But instead, Aronian played knight d7. So developing straight away, but now came e5. So sacrificing a second pawn. And now e6. So this is just a very direct attempt to break up black's kingside pawns and get through to the king. And I mean, it's very logical with black's rooks on the other side of the board and you know white's pieces are pointing in the right direction so knight f8 at least defends um, h7 so pawn takes pawn check and here well there's there's a couple of decent continuations the game continuation was strong rook e1 is very strong indeed, a really simple move. The basic idea is that if, let's say, bishop f6 looks logical to, so that um, the king can now step back, then there's this move, bishop takes pawn. Absolutely deadly move. Obviously, keeping the king in the middle, and if knight takes bishop, then check, and bishop e3 just slices across um, we're going to see more of that in the game. So I think rook e1 is also very strong, but uh, knight d4 played, and that also opens up the queen's line to, well, all these squares, really. Now, king g8 is probably the best move, but, I mean, this is very tricky, and it's possible that Aronian simply rejected this because of knight e6, which looks absolutely terrifying, because if knight takes, then... Well, you can see that the king is just, um, it's, it's just all over. I mean, this is absolutely terrible. White's pieces are so strong. But king g8 should be played after knight e6. In fact, queen d7 keeps black in the game. I mean, this looks awful after knight takes pawn. And again, bishop b2 check will be coming. Um, but in fact... Black survives by giving this up. And, I mean, this position is just completely unclear. But understandably, you know, uh, probably Aronian felt that was too dangerous. Instead, he played bishop f6, but once again, this move, bishop, F, bishop h7, is incredibly strong. Um, so if that's taken, we have the same idea. Um, queen e6, I think, is really powerful. Um, and if bishop takes knight here, check. And now we take on d5. And rook takes b7. So this rook on the b file coming good. And queen e5 was played. Rook b7 check. If the rook interposes, then... Queen h5 check, and I mean, this is just horrific. So many open files, open diagonals. So bishop d7 was played to block the king, uh, block the, the rook's check. Queen g4, just putting more pressure here. And if, let's say, rook d8, then knight f3, and queen check is very powerful. And this this bishop is always waiting in the wings. Queen takes knight played. Rook takes bishop. 
Now, white is the exchange down, but the king, well, it's just scythe to death after you know moves like this. Once again, this move bishop a3. Um, and and black just has no defence here. Well, for example, if the bishop's defended with the rook, queen e6 and queen g8. If the queen comes back to defend, then bishop a3, queen d5 check again, and queen g8 mate. So a last little trick from Aronian, queen e5, and of course if that's captured then there's a back rank check mate. But a simple winning move for white, bishop d2, very cool. Now the queen is threatened again. If it drops, then queen f5. This is pretty bad. Those diagonals just being cut open. So for example, this and the king just doesn't escape. I mean, this is absolutely beautiful. I'm, I'm sometimes asked, why are the two bishops so powerful? Well, just, just take a look at this game. <laughs> And I think you can see in an open position playing together, particularly with other pieces, queens and rooks, they are deadly. Let's see another variation. Um, queen d7, queen here, and queen g8. So after bishop d2, rook d8 attacking white's queen. After queen g4, Aronian resigned. So there's still a threat of rook takes queen. Queen drops back, then nice winning move, bishop g5. And when that's taken, check bishop g6, queen takes bishop, queen takes bishop, mate, and here, and queen f7. Absolutely deadly. So with that victory, uh, Maxim Matlakov uh, evens the score in the match, one all. So they go to a tie break tomorrow. Um, Matlakov, in case you haven't heard of him, he's a Russian player, 26 years old. He's currently rated 27-28. He's just another of these Russians, incredibly strong, that are just kind of bubbling under, uh, not far from you know the, the, the elite, uh, but they just don't get the opportunities. Um, who knows? Perhaps... Matlakov will have his chance in this World Cup to make more of a name in the West. Uh, so tie breaks tomorrow. There are quite a few matches going to the tie break. Um, Naya against Caruana, uh, MVL against Lenderman, Navarra Grishuk. I should maybe I should say the players have gone through. Boo has gone through, be, defeated Carlson. Wesley So Ivanchuk who defeated Kramnik. Wang Hao, Fedosev, Rodstein, Dubov, and Svidler. Svidler looking good at the moment, actually. But the big names that have gone out today, Magnus Carlsen, Hikaru Nakamura, knocked out by Fedosev, another of these Russians who are very, very strong. And, yep, just mentioned, Kramnik, knocked out by Ivanchuk. Tie breaks tomorrow. <laughs>